welcome to at and Front Track for April 30th, 2013. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. I'm joined today by Josh Lackey and Jim Clausing, and I'm John Hogeboom, of course. So uh, we're going to jump into the first story, and I'll cover it. It's, um, uh, it's about Trend Micro. They recently put out a report. Uh, it's their first quarter cybersecurity report, and uh, Trend Micro does, uh, they, they put out some of these other reports before. They have um, a pretty good track record, in my opinion. Uh, they put out some good information, and I thought there was some interesting stuff in here uh, relative to what we might have talked about last week. So uh, the link's here uh, for everybody. They can go take a look at it and read the fall report, but I'm just going to cover some of the highlights here that they mentioned uh, the, the big story is that zero-day zero drive-by attacks was one of the most prevalent attack vectors, um, mostly via Java and Adobe Reader, Flash, those types of things uh, in the first quarter of this year. That's no surprise. I think we've been talking about that uh, most of this first quarter as well. Uh, as well as last year, uh, we know a lot of these exploit kits um, are the big trend nowadays, and there's more. It used to be primarily black hole exploit kit, but now we're seeing things like the white hole exploit kit and cool exploit kit um, are, are ones that are, have been emerging in the first quarter of this year. Uh, basically, same kind of thing. It's a kit that allows you to kind of create a drive-by exploit web page, and they put all the exploits onto the page for you, and then you can exploit people and drop whatever malware you want on the machine uh, or on the victims, as it were. Uh, a couple other statistics. Uh, most of the botnet controllers um, in their report are located in the United States. That's so probably not a huge surprise. Uh, Thirty-five percent of them are in the United States, and most of the bots are also located in the United States uh, at 28 percent. That's also not a huge surprise to me because the United States is one of the most um, uh, probably technologically uh, savvy countries. Uh, most people have computers, so it kind of makes sense that most uh, most of the bots would be located in the United States. Uh, one of the other interesting uh, tidbits here that they had in the uh, article was the top botnets that they're tracking. Um, Downadup was the number one, which I was a little surprised about, only because it's been around for so long. It also goes under the name Conficker. And, um, and this one is kind of effectively, in my opinion, not really active. I think we have it under control with the Conficker Working Group. They've kind of uh, sinkholed all the domains and whatnot uh, involved with uh, Conficker, but there are a lot of bots still out there. Uh, their estimations are in the order of 741,000. Uh, number two on the list is what they call Trojan Underbar Z-Axis or CyrFF, uh, which is what we call Zero Axis, which we've talked about quite a bit on this show. Um, actually, I actually have another chart for that later on, and that's at uh, 274,000. Uh, so I thought that was interesting that they uh, they identified the one that we've kind of been talking about as being kind of noisy on our network and what we see uh, as being the number two infection in um, uh, terms of the number of bots out there. And again, uh, the zero access is kind of a um, the click fraud botnet basically instructs the bots to go click on advertising in order to try to generate advertising revenue for uh, whoever's running that uh, particular botnet. And then uh, there's another one, Adware Price Gong, which I'm not really familiar with, uh, is in the number three spot. That might be another one for me to go take a closer look at. Uh, another interesting thing, and this goes back to last week, we, we went over a report from an independent security uh, firm that did an analysis specific to spam. And um, uh, Trend also has some statistics here on spam. And they mentioned that um, uh, almost 90% of all spam is in English. And then they had some other languages, which were the, the lesser common, Chinese, Japanese, et cetera. I think we were talking on the show last week. Gee, I wonder what the mix is if you were to look at everything. So this is kind of an interesting uh, study to see uh, that predominantly English and then very small percentages in other languages. Um, and then in – go ahead. I think it's interesting, you know, a couple of years ago we were talking about uh, the – attacks coming from China, Russia, Korea, and so you see some Chinese language, some of the Japanese, Russian, German. I don't see any Korean on there. That doesn't, didn't make the top ten. Uh, yeah, it appears to not have. It must be in this others category somewhere. Yeah, yeah that's kind of surprising. Um, and then 
in the terms of the top 10 spam sending countries, uh, 11% or almost 12% is coming from the United States, and then in smaller variations uh, from other countries um, on this list here. India and Vietnam, I think, were identified in the other report we looked at last week as being, if you get a spam from that country, it's probably malicious. Uh, it has a very high, I think it was in the high 70% ratio of being um, likely to be a, a actual legion of malware uh, from the spams originating from those countries. This is a little bit different. I think we saw in that previous report that more of it came from the United States, but I'd have to go back and actually, I'm not quite sure on the percentages there, but it seemed like it was a much higher amount uh, from what I recall. And uh, I think that uh, that was the, the, the major uh, highlights of the, the report. There is a bunch of stuff uh, in there as well about APT, and they talk about some of the APT trends. Uh, as well as uh, mobile malware, uh, which uh, I didn't cover. I was just kind of covering some of the things that I think we've been talking about recently. I recommend you go check it out. It's a pretty good report, and it's not too long, maybe 20 pages or so. Um, so that's that story. I don't know if anybody else had any other uh, insights or comments about that. Uh, so uh, moving forward, um, the next story, I think, Josh, you had um, – you had our next story, something about Google mandating um, mandating some policies on where you can download the apps from or something of that nature? It, it, so, yeah, it's an interesting story. I mean, I think it's really important. Essentially, Google Play, it's not, it's not like they're manda mandating where you can download the apps, but mandating where the apps can update from. So, uh, there, you know... I mean, Apple actually is doing a really good job in this area, right? They've always kept their, their app store pretty well locked down. Um, Android yeah, has been sort of a free-for-all for the past couple of years. You know, not, not horribly bad, but definitely not as locked down. And so one of the things that Google has just done is said, hey, if you've got an application running on your phone, it can't just connect to a random website to update itself because you could easily put – you know, any program you want, a total, you know, non-malicious game, get it on the App Store, and then once somebody downloads it and runs it, then you update it and you have, like, whatever you want to run there, so whatever malicious code you want. So I think it's a real, I mean, it's a good move by Google. I, I think that was really important, and I think it's a, an excellent step to start locking down their App Store. So essentially what they're saying is if you got the app from them and the updates also have to come from them, Exactly, exactly, which, you know, is – it's the hindsight is twenty twenty, right? That seems pretty dang obvious once, once, uh, once you have to say it. But, like, beforehand, you might not have actually realized that maybe your apps were updating from, you know, who knows where. Yeah, I think that's a good move. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you look at, like you said, Apple's track record um, uh, with their store – and you can pretty much, as far as I know, unless you jailbreak your phone, you can really only update or get apps via the, um, the iTunes or the Apple Store. Uh, very low amounts of malware, if any, that I've ever seen um, for, uh, you know, the iPhone and whatnot. But in, in the Android space, we've definitely seen more. There's a big story uh, that broke a couple of weeks ago as well related to Android and uh, some malware related around there. So this is definitely... Um, uh, a good move in the right direction. I guess maybe they're learning from other people's uh, um, uh, mistakes or whatnot, and that, you know, I think uh, Apple had the right policy there. It looks like uh, Google's kind of moving more towards that uh, philosophy. I mean, these are really powerful computing devices, and we're making them simple enough for anybody to use. So we're really moving them out across population that maybe didn't own a desktop before. This is their only computer they now own, and so we're making it really easy for anyone to use. So. Well, personally, as a developer, I enjoy being able to, you know, play with open source and mess with my phone and do things. I think for, you know, my grandmother, I think I'd rather have her just be locked down and secure. Exactly. Absolutely. Yep. All right. Well, thanks for that story. That's, uh, that's a, sounds like a good move in the right direction. I guess we'll keep an eye on that and see how that works out for them uh, over the, the next months and maybe the whole year. Uh, okay. So uh, next story uh, on our list here is from you, Jim, and uh, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this, but it's uh, something about the Apache Seedworks attacks. Yeah, uh, this one 
uh, first came to my attention um, oh, a few days ago last week. Um, it, there, there have been a couple of articles posted about it, um, one in Ars Technica, one from ESET, and one from Securi, and it's the Securi one that I saw first, actually. Um, basically, there's been an, a, some folks uh, for a few weeks now, going back into March, maybe back into February, there's been targeted attacks against um, Apache web servers. You know, we've seen the, some WordPress attacks against WordPress sites, some with cPanel and other, some of those other um, content management systems. And this particular one, um, uh, Daniel Sid uh, wrote about it in the security blog. Um, it, it looks like these attackers have changed their tactics a little bit. And in particular, in some of the cases where they were able to um, reach cPanel, and it doesn't—he doesn't go into how they did that. Probably via um, cracked passwords, brute force passwords, or something like that. Um, but on some of these servers, instead of um, uploading a, another Apache module and modifying. Or, or modifying the you know the WordPress uh, modules that are installed. Uh, what they're doing in this particular attack, the CDORC attack, is they're actually replacing the Apache binary itself with with one that's got um, malicious code compiled in. And um, and one of the key things, one of the things that they talk about in the ESET article, is that. Um, un, there's nothing really on the disk then that would alert you. Uh, you know, there's there's no additional config file. There's no additional module that shows up in the Apache modules directory. Um, it's only the modified Apache binary itself on the disk, and everything else is kept in a shared memory segment in the running uh, in the running process. Um, so one of the things that they talk about is, you know, in some cases, if you're trying to respond to an incident, you know something weird is going on on your server, you get on there and in the old school forensics thing, you image the disk, you shut it down, you pull the plug kind of thing, and you'd miss all of the stuff that's in this shared memory segment. Now, these days, most of the guys who... Uh, do incident response and forensics that I know. Um, in addition to imaging the disk, they're going to first actually try to pull a, a memory image, and so they'd be able to detect some of this stuff. But um, yeah, one of the things that this brought to mind for me is you know the need to be vigilant in monitoring your system, um, you know, doing the file integrity checks. You know, Tripwire has been around for 20 years now, um, and there are um, other similar kinds of things that you can run. Uh, the folks who manage these, especially the, the shared servers, need to be vigilant for monitoring um, for changes to, especially to the binaries on their system. As soon as they detect that the binary has been changed, that they need to be alerted to that immediately and take some immediate action. In this particular case, uh, it's not as simple as just copying good binary back on top of it because one of the things these guys do is they uh, set the immutable bit on it, um, use the chatter uh, mix utility um, to make it so that the you can't simply Overwrite it. You've got to flip that bit back, uh, the binary back into place. So, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say. So, are they? Are they? I guess they would need some kind of root level access though to overwrite this binary, right? Yeah. The um, yes. 
And uh, apparently they've got some exploit uh, via, Daniel said that he was seeing it in cPanel um, installations. So they, they must have some other exploit there that they used to get this in there in the first place. That That is true. There's also, um, in one of the articles, they suggested that they, uh, the bad guys may also be trojaning the SSHD. Um, now, I didn't see that, and I, ha and I have not actually got my hands on um, uh, binaries to look at myself. But yeah, apparently they are managing to get root level on these uh, shared servers or on these Apache servers so that they can replace the Apache binary. Okay, very interesting. So, um, you know, you, you bring up a bunch of good points. Uh, something we talked about before, if you don't have something like Tripwire, even just some simple script you want to find and trying to see what's been changed on the system recently, uh, that's a good idea. Um, these types of attacks to me are what I worry about most because we've seen a trend lately where there's been a lot of um, compromises on web servers to turn them into bots. Uh, not to say that this is they're turning them into bots or it sounds like these might be for distributing malware or deploying some kind of drive-by exploits, but uh, I get real nervous about when web servers become bots or potential bots in a botnet because they've got a lot of power. Um, they're usually on some kind of high-powered shared web hosting server and they have a lot of bandwidth accessible to them. So if they wanted to do attacks, they, they can, um, you know, really push out a lot of packets. Whereas a, a regular person's machine at home has a limited amount of bandwidth. They probably have a regular PC. They're probably going to be throttled a little bit in terms of how much attack traffic they could throw at something. Uh, so these types of things, um, you know, make me concerned. I think it's on the onus on both the ISPs or whoever's the web hosting provider as well as yourself as the user of maybe a shared web hosting server to, to monitor your, your website and your web server to see if it's been uh, tampered with, uh, because we know that that's been a, a growing trend lately. Yeah, in, in this particular case, you know, the, this um, malware that sits in the shared memory segment, um, it can be controlled via um, tailored crafted get requests to the web server and it you know it'll intercept those not write those queries to the logs yeah, it's, it's got capabilities at the moment it seems to be mostly just for doing drive-by type uh, malware downloads but um, it possibilities are are pretty great there and you know like you said in my, for my church website that I'm, you know, manage, um, so it's on a shared server. I just have a script that checks uh, MD5 and SHA-1 hashes of all of the files in our uh, directories every night. So I can tell I actually did detect a, a break in that way once. So it, it's something that, you know, monitoring your own website is something that can be done even if you're not running something like Tripwire. So you know that the common way around that is that open for execute and open for read are two different system calls. So if I was already read on your box and I really wanted to mess up your script, I would just say open for read, open that one, open for execute, open that one. And every time you did MD5 and SHA-1 on it, you'd be fine. You'd be like, oh, nope, same program, but when you did an open for execute, it would do something else. So still, it's still an excellent idea. The tripwire idea is still good, but just if someone's root on your box, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, you, you may not be able to detect it. So be careful. Yeah. That's a really good point. And it's almost, you know, normally you can trust the HTTP daemon on a machine that it's not going to get changed, and you're usually looking for PHP files or something else that's dropped on there that's changed. But in this case, something like this happens, um, and you you are actually able to detect it, like you said, might be difficult. Um, you're probably going to want to, you know, try to re rebuild the box from scratch if possible, because um, you're never going to be quite sure if you've gotten everything. Yeah, well, and the, the predecessor to this attack was the, the Dark Leech ones where they actually dropped um, 
uh, an Apache module, um, but that was, you know, and then I modified the config to load that when the server started up. Um, but this one where they've modified the binary itself is, yeah, it's an ugly one. So, you know, just to recap, you know, we, we're talking about this one, which is against Apache web servers. Um, we talked probably a couple of weeks ago, maybe, about WordPress sites. Uh, they're getting brute forced into and compromised. Um, we don't know what purpose that's for yet, uh, but they're building a botnet out of compromised WordPress sites. We know that there's this Robot that's out there that's been out there since sometime late last year, compromised of Joomla websites that have been compromised, uh, all web servers. Uh, and then I think at one point we had Stan on maybe last month or something talking about some of these APT actors who are actually uh, looking to compromise Tomcat. And uh, I know there's some other botnets that actually look for Tomcat and try to brute force their way into the Tomcat. They deploy a, a JSP onto the Tomcat that can actually give them some kind of remote administration toolkit functionality. So like we said, a lot of different vectors discussed here, but the common platform is web servers. There really been, there's been a move recently uh, that I kind of am perceiving to compromise web servers and use them for whatever types of purposes they want. Because, you know, my guess is people don't really have, you know, you're not sitting in front of a web server in terms of using it and knowing if something went wrong with it. Whereas your PC, you might notice something's quirky when you're infected. Um, that's just me guessing. I'm hypothesizing why. Uh, plus, there's a lot more power and bandwidth. They might be able to exist longer there. There's no antivirus running on these things usually. Um, so it's very unlikely or it's less likely that they're going to get detected, um, these types of intrusions. All right. Uh, very good story. Thanks for bringing that. Um, I had a lot of things to say about it, obviously. <laughs> uh, so the Internet weather report, let's jump over to that and see what's been cooking over uh, in that space. And we have a few few things, nothing, nothing dramatic here, uh, kind of a lot of repeats of the same things we've always seen, but I got one in particular that's a little different. Uh, the uh, first one we have is scanning activity on 2967 TCP. This is old, old, old. I don't even know how old this is. Probably uh, it could be eight years or more old, but it's a vulnerability in semantic. And to this day, we still see small numbers of sources scanning um, for anybody listening on this port. This was a vulnerability in a particular semantic product that allowed them to, um, you know, gain, uh, uh, basically uh, do remote code execution. And you can see here, this is the last 15 days shown picture. Uh, there's probably every seven days or so, it almost looks like, uh, a, a small number of sources come through looking for anybody that's still running this. My, you know, I don't know why they're still doing this. There could be small numbers of machines out there still running this. I would be very surprised, but you never know. Sometimes people get those, you know, desktop PCs. They got a lot of bundled software on there. The software could have never been really registered or activated, but they did leave it running on the machine uh, because, you know, some user bought it or whatever. So that could be a possibility of some that are still out there uh, existing. Uh, or it could be that there's – go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, could it also be maybe an older scanning package that somebody, some hacker is using to scan for hosts, and it just happens to be one of the selected things they're scanning for, and it's just, you know, stupid to do, but that happens to be this old scanning program. Okay. That, that was just about. Yeah, no, that's entirely possible. Um, I did do a little try to correlate to see if we saw there was a single source here in these ones that we're looking at to see if he was scanning anything else. It didn't show up, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't. It's just that it might have been some other ports that have very high thresholds for us that we didn't, you know, it didn't cross a barrier for us in order to indicate that it looked like scanning. So, um, but that's entirely possible that that's the case as well. Um, that it's just part of a suite of scanning that uh, various ports and protocols that um, the scanner might be looking for to try to uh, compromise. Our honeypots get hit with that uh, on a daily basis. It's yeah. amazing yeah. that vulnerability, as you said, was a, it's at least eight years old, maybe more than that. Right. Uh, been closed for years. But yeah. Our pick it up. Uh, every, just about every day. 
We should uh, maybe we should set a machine up and uh, that's got that old software on it and see if it actually gets compromised by one of these guys in the honeypot. You know. Uh, actually, our honeypot does get malware dropped on it when when it gets hit with that. Oh, interesting. Oh, that might be interesting to go analyze that a little bit more and see what they're putting on there. But um, uh, is it old malware too? I mean, is it like really old malware, or are they actually updating their malware? Uh, I haven't really paid a, too much attention to what malware gets dropped that way via some of the other methods that our honeypots pick up. But uh, yeah, it, it gets stuff dropped. On a regular basis, is still even after all this time. Interesting. Uh, okay, uh, the next one. Uh, I think Brian might have covered this last week as well. It's uh, port seven 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 eight TCP, uh, which is officially registered in IANA as Interwise. Interwise, I believe they're referring to the uh, desktop conferencing software. Uh, it's kind of a, a web web sharing conferencing software, which actually was um, purchased by AT&T, and uh, AT&T actually owns Interwise now. Um, but I don't think that's what this is actually looking for, uh, that being said. Uh, this is uh, the last 30 days shown, and uh, here's last week. We saw a lot of scanning activity on that as well. It's a small number of sources in China and Russia. And then there was a big lull here through um, uh, a few days, looks like about six days, and we've seen you know, a few more spikes of activity here in terms of scanning activity. If I was to guess, uh, Oracle is more commonly known to have used this port. Uh, that would be my guess is probably what they're looking for. Could be wrong. Uh, Tribes, which is gaming, also has been known to use this port. I don't think that's what this is, but I'm just putting it there. Uh, the other option, and this is really going out on a limb, is that uh, 7778 is also one digit above 6667, which is also the well-known IRC port. Uh, it might be an attempt to look for IRC. That's really out on a limb. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, these are just some guesses. I don't really have a, a good explanation of what they're looking for here. Um, I'm going to guess is my number one choice is it's probably something to do with, with uh, seeking Oracle um, servers that are running. I believe there is some actual an older exploit uh, available or exploitable on uh, an old version of Oracle over port 7778. And then this is, I'm going to put this one in my bucket of uh, uh, beats the heck out of me. But we saw uh, over the past few days here, it looks like maybe the past three or four days, uh, increased scanning on several ports, 40,601 through 40,607. Uh, TCP. These are unassigned. There's some other software protocols that kind of hang out in these general areas, but um, doesn't really uh, have any, uh, doesn't look like it's related to anything well known that I can find. Uh, it's a very small number of sources in China. And you can see that prior to this, you know, prior to looks like the 28th, uh, April 28th, we saw no scanning activity on this. And uh, it's really ramped up. Uh, and there's some there's some kind of pattern in here where, you know, this dark green section here is 40607, and they scan that for a period of time, and then they seem to stop with that one, and they did 40602, which is the um, kind of aqua color here. Uh, but then there's other ones where they're doing it all the time, such as the purple, which is 40601. No idea what this really is or why they're doing it. Um, but it's pretty significant volumes. You know, we're getting about 14 million scan flows per hour aggregate um, in, the, in the peaks here. So that's not an insignificant number of uh, scanning activity. Could be some peer-to-peer -peer protocol or something that I don't know about. Uh, but it, I doubt it, only because it's a very small number of sources. Normally, with the peer-to-peer -peer stuff, we see a lot more participants um, involved. I have one theory, though. Uh, I was looking at kind of the sources involved here, and one of them is uh, one of the sources involved in this 40,601 scanning, et cetera, is also scanning 8808 TCP. Uh, he did a big batch of this, um, uh, looks like between April 29th and 30th, uh, and today is the 30th, so just last night into today. Uh, these times are UTC, of course. And um, uh, so there could be, you know, I would suspect that even though this port is unassigned officially, 
it's probably something HTTP related. Uh, generally, these things up in the 8,000 ranges or with eights in them are, um, are related to H HTTP. So I suspect maybe there's something with the 40,600 range that is as well that I'm just not familiar with. So I would say if you're watching the program and you have any idea what these are, please let us know. Uh, it is fairly new. Hopefully, as time goes on, I'll, we'll, we'll figure out what these are, um, especially if it continues to persist. Uh, but if you have any idea what it might be, we'd be more than interested to hear from you. You just e email us at uh, tra track at list.att.com if you have any info. Especially if you're someone from China and you're actually on one of those IP addresses, we'd love to get email from you and just tell us <laughs> what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if you're committing to scanning, then we, that would be like going right to the source there to find out the information. So uh, in terms of the uh, scanning activity and our uh, pie chart wheels that we have here, this is the most frequently probed ports, uh, not necessarily the most actors involved, but most often scanned ports. And usual characters here, we've got all the zero access ports, which I'll highlight, these 16,000 ranges. Actually, I guess we only see two of them in, in the pie chart in the top 10 here, uh, uh, 445 TCP. Windows File Sharing 1433 is Microsoft SQL. You've got your remote desktop protocol, your SSH, your VNC, your Telnet, all remote, you know, remote access, remote console type of uh, facilities they're trying to get into your machines. Um, and that's, a lot of that is brute force scanning as well involved with that stuff. And then uh, 8080 TCP, which could be any variety of things. It's probably HTTP, again, I think Tomcat might use that as a default port as well, which we were just talking about. Um, but there are probably a lot of other software packages as well that uh, use that port for alternate types of uh, functionality with the web server. And then in terms of the most sources probing, um, we have uh, pretty much the same thing, very similar uh, patterns here, but the zero access bots kind of show up more. So we have a lot more bots or more sources scanning on these ports than there are source uh, probes in general. So you can see the zero access ones in these 16,000 ranges um, uh, uh, showing up in the top 10 wheel. And then uh, the remote administration ones like Telnet and RDP again as well showing up uh, towards the top. And it looks like that's about it for this week. Um, and then, since we've been talking about zero access, and you know they had it in the Trend Micro report saying it was the number two botnet uh, in terms of size. I guess that's what they're probably shooting for their size. Wanted to wish zero access a happy birthday because this is pretty much right around this time frame, around May 1st. Uh, today is April 30th, and uh, it was right around this time frame that the P2P variant of zero access uh, emerged. And it quickly ramped up. We've shown this over the past year or so that you know this continues to um, continues to be a problem. And it uh, looks like it's pretty much you know going strong. I don't see any signs of decline necessarily. So uh, and we also know, uh, although I didn't point it out, if you read that Trend Micro report, they talk about some of these exploit kits that they're seeing, and um, a lot of them are dropping zero access as part of their payload. So that kind of explains why that's the, the number one uh, botnet, or the number two botnet, I should say, clarification there, according to Trend Micro. So with that, we're going to go to the top concerns. Um, I don't particularly have one off the top of my head, but I know, Josh, you had, um, you had a top concern uh, or something that was on your mind recently. Yeah, I don't know if it's not necessarily a top concern, but it was certainly a very interesting story I've been following. So, I mean, we, you know, we see lots of DOS attacks, lots of DDoS attacks out on the net. And in general, I kind of wonder how these attackers make money off of them, right? You know, I mean, is it blackmail? Are they just doing it for fun? You know, I, I think there's various ways they, they can monetize this type of attack, but it's not necessarily so straightforward. So it was really fascinating to read about this DDoS attack that really made the attackers a lot of money. So. Um, we've got to talk about Internet nerd money a little bit first. So Bitcoin, right? It's uh, essentially a currency commodity thing, and you can, and it's also a payment network, right? And it's all, it's, it's 
a currency that's not backed by anything except for open source software and people who are running the, the software. So it's, you know, fascinating, fascinating program, fascinating project. I mean, really interesting. Uh, one of the things I've been saying is I think in the, over the next eight years, uh, you're going to see a lot of uh, economics PhDs really using some of the data from the Bitcoin experiment. I think that it's just, you know, sort of something that's never been tried and pretty cool. But uh, the reason I was sort of really interested in, in this one particular job attack is, is essentially there's one major exchange right now for Bitcoin. So they've been growing a bit, but right now pretty much 80% of any sort of exchanging, you know, you want to you want to buy or sell Bitcoin to go to an exchange, and there's really just one, and it, and it has about 80% of the, 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 the business, right? There, there's more than just one, but there's one main one. And so what these attackers did a couple weeks ago there was a uh, you know pretty big raise in price. I mean, basically it rose in price by like ten thousand percent over just a couple of weeks. And what the attackers, you know, so I mean, it was ridiculously huge raise in price. And what these attackers did was they waited until the volume of the you know the the buying and selling volume went down a little bit on this exchange, and then they dumped a whole bunch of coins. And so essentially what they were trying to do is cause some sort you know, maybe a small panic. And so normal day-to-day, -day, now remember, this is not something that would happen on a normal exchange, right? There's so much liquidity in a normal exchange, you could dump millions and millions and millions of dollars or yens or euros, and you wouldn't move the market at all. Like no one would even really notice. Bitcoin's smaller market, so you can actually move it a little bit, you know, if you have enough coins. So what they did was they dumped some coins, started causing a little bit of sell-off, and then they started DDoSing the site. And what that caused, basically, everybody started seeing the price fall, and they couldn't connect to their account and do anything about it because it was, this site was being DDoSed. And so they just kept this up. They kept this up. They kept this up, and the price starts falling. And then as the price starts falling, it starts falling through, I mean, I don't want to go too deep into financial exchanges and how they work, but people put various stop losses and things like that. And so it was, you know, hitting people's stop loss, and then they'd sell their coins. And so the market just really started free falling. And, I mean, other interesting things, like, you know, sometimes you'd be able to get in and everything was so slow. You, you know, if, if the price was at 170, you're like, okay, I'm going to, you know, put up my, my coins to sell at 170. But by the time, you know, everything's going so slow, by the time your sell order hit it, the market was already down to 150, so your order never executed. And so you're like, okay, move it down to 150. And by the time that one got there, it was down to 130. And then you're like, okay, I sell at the market rate. So, you know, so it really, really, really started just, just diving, diving quickly. And the attackers stopped their DDoS attack, bought all their coins back, and essentially made something like a lot of money, let's just put it that way. So fascinating way for, you know, these very, very clever attackers to come up with a way to monetize these attacks that maybe, you know, previously weren't so easy to monetize. So is there a lesson learned for, you know, our customers? Uh, probably not. This is a pretty pretty, you know, unique situation. However, I think maybe the, the one takeaway is that these BAM hackers are clever, and if they have the opportunity to make money doing some of these things, you can imagine the best of the, the cleverest of them will actually be out there attacking you. So even if you think, uh, this attack class, this attack category may not be so important, turns out in the long run it actually may be. It just requires a sufficient adversary with, you know, enough intelligence to be able to figure out how to use it against you. So fascinating story. I, I really, I really uh, enjoyed following just these attackers actually making money from a DOS attack. So. We didn't talk about this story, but Associated Press Twitter uh, feed got hacked last week, and uh, they had posted some... Uh, some bulletin about the White House, uh, a bombing, something or another of, of that nature, a fake story that caused the stock market uh, to have a momentary blip where it went down significantly, and then I think it recovered within five, ten minutes or something uh, once it was, you know, uh, revealed that that was a, uh, you know, a hack or a fake uh, alert bulletin. But it kind of it's a similar analogy there that these these uh, financial markets are somewhat fragile and you know a, a hacker in both in both situations here was able to kind of move that market or show some kind of um, you know vulnerability and, and move the market prices 
uh, in both of the situations. Now, it sounds like the Bitcoin actually were able to do something. I don't think anybody was in the, uh, uh, in the AP uh, case that I'm aware of. Uh, but I guess, you know, they have the SEC that would go investigate something like that, where I don't think Bitcoin does, right? They're kind of their own market. Yeah, they're, they're on their own, right? It's, uh, however, I think that was an excellent, an excellent example because, um, it, it, you know, I think the, uh, the fact that they were actually able to move the stock market with, with a hacked Twitter account, right? I mean, I think that's just uh, vastly more powerful. Maybe they didn't really realize that they were going to do that. I think the Boston bombing had something to do with it, right? We were already feeling a little bit nervous at the time when that tweet went out. So that it's sort of understandable that maybe not just every day you hack AP's Twitter account and cause the market to move. But uh, certainly in that in that case, that was very interesting. Yeah, well, and in, in this, if you know, 24-hour news cycles and everybody, you know, monitoring things like Twitter for the the latest news, you know. It just shows how, how interconnected everything is, you know, the financial markets with all of this. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting story. Um, I think our, our viewers will uh, appreciate your enthusiasm in delivering it, too. Uh, it was a good story. Did you have, um, did you have any uh, particular uh, concerns this week, Jim? I hate to put you on the spot. Yeah, well, no, we actually kind of talked about most of mine when we were talking about the Sea uh, dork thing earlier is uh, that got me thinking about you know monitoring your servers and how we, how closely you have to monitor them for things like this. Um, it's it's something that back in my you know sysadmin days I used to set up all kinds of automation for this to text messages or pages whenever. You know, something changed when I wasn't expecting it, but I'm not sure what the state of the art is anymore since that's not my day job anymore. But right, just got me thinking about that again. Right, no, that's a good point. So the homework assignment for all of our viewers is if you have a website um, and it's maybe on one of these shared web hosting or wherever it is, go check it out and see if any files have changed recently that you haven't, that you're not expecting to have changed. Uh, and or set up some automated scripting to, to look for that kind of activity. Uh, that's uh, a highly recommended thing. Even something simple is better than nothing at all. So, um, Okay, so that's our show for today. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at threattrack at list.att.com. You can also find us at Twitter um, at, at threattrack. And the Threat Track video is available at att.com slash Threat Track and on YouTube. And you can subscribe to our audio-only feed on iTunes. So uh, thanks uh, again for joining us today. Thanks to Josh and Jim for joining, uh, joining me on the show. We'll be back next week with a new episode. Until then, keep your network safe.